see you. So excited for you and Christina to come and see our headquarters here. You'll see all okay. the behind the scenes. We may cross oh. our fingers. Everybody cross it. our fingers. We got it. Okay. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Molly. We might need to go over on Seiko's side of things. Yay. Okay, so we are now, y'all, live from both my Facebook and from Seiko's Facebook. Yay. Okay, people are now on both. So here's kind of how this is going to work, y'all. Um, Ellie and I, we actually, the reason that Ellie is joining us today, everybody say hi to Ellie. Hi. Uh, is because Ellie is one of the newer members of Team you. Seiko. Yes. She's also a team member that joined Seiko after we were we, we were already established as a direct yeah. sales brand. So yeah. it's been really fun. Unlike Bree, who was really a part of the transition and transformation and all of those conversations behind the scenes about why we're shifting and, and our purpose behind it, Ellie kind of came in after all of those decisions were made. <laughs> so I came in with a lot of questions. <laughs> like, so many a questions. Lot. And then we realized I kept coming to Ben and Liz with all these questions about the business model and why Seiko does things, and then they told me that they actually had all these questions. And we asked all of these questions, <laughs> and we've had thousands of hours of conversations about these exact things. And we were like, maybe if the founders had all these questions and the newest employee has all these questions, maybe, just maybe, someone else in the world is wondering why we do what we do yeah. and what we do. Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> can I get an amen for here at, here at Seiko? Um, those of you who are fellows, those of you who work at HQ, who are even some of our customers, hopefully will know that one of our MOs is total transparency yeah. and authenticity. And that means transparency as it relates to where our products come from and how our team in Uganda is treated to why we run our business the way yeah. that we do. Um, it's something that Ben and I hold very dearly. And now that we've had the fellows and we have people on our team that are building their lives and their financial goals and their families and their purpose – right along with us, we have a very high sense of uh, responsibility that all the cards are on the table yeah. and that they understand our part, our vision, why we're making the decisions that we are. And so this is just one of those kind of efforts to uh, create that level of transparency. So here's how it's going to work. Um, Ellie and I are going to kind of just recap a lot of the conversation that we've had over the last mm -hmm. several months uh, since she's joined. If at any point you guys have specific questions, please type those questions. Bree is going to be like our amazing moderator. She's going to be reading through all of so the good. questions. She'll chime in occasionally um, with questions. And then at the end, we'll also have time for any questions that didn't get answered. Yeah. So, um, We've got lots of people joining. Lots yay, of love. Yay, it's so fun to see everybody. And lots of fellows on. Before we get going too far in, Bree, can we make sure that we don't run out of power? That part is not yes. going anywhere. Oh, moment. yes, yes. So, yeah, sure okay. yeah, yeah. so we'll, get, we'll get started with that. And uh, Bree's going to get us hooked up on power, but we're going to kick off. So, all right. So my first question when I started um, I actually didn't realize till I was hired here that Seiko was not always a direct sales company. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I was like, well, if you weren't always, why did you do this? <laughs> so I love this question, and it's something that actually, as I've been working on another project, mm -hmm. that hopefully I'll tell you guys about soon, I've been ruminating a lot on uh, the idea of channeling your inner beginner, if you will, mm -hmm. and how... Um, Sometimes a lack of experience yeah. isn't actually dinging us or it's not keeping us from being innovative or for being for being great leaders or having success. It's actually, I think, can be an incredible asset. And starting the fellows program is one of the clearest examples of that because we came to the table, neither Ben or I have any background or experience in direct sales. Honestly, not even like anecdotally. Like yeah. we don't have moms that did it. We yeah. don't have aunts that did it. Like we didn't grow up in communities where it was really prevalent. So we had very, very little understanding of the industry. Yeah. So we didn't set out to create a direct sales company, okay. to be honest. So we set out to create a company that would revolutionize how we connect consumers to producers, mm -hmm. that would um, help educate and empower young women in Uganda to go to university. How we did that, the business model kind of on the retail side, for the first six years of our company was kind of like, however we have to do it. <laughs> Whatever we have to do okay. to sell the sandals okay. to sure. send women in Uganda sure. to school. To be completely transparent with you guys, we didn't spend a lot of time and effort thinking about our model in the U.S. So we really just kind of went on autopilot and followed the very kind of par for the course script yeah. for retail, which is you sell wholesale, uh -huh. which means you sell the, the products at a discount to stores, and those stores 
resell the products to consumers and then they keep the money that they, you know, the profit. Um, and we sell online. So we ran our business. Ben and I, Ben quit his full time job after I'd been running Seiko for about a year. We sold everything that we owned. We lived out of our Honda Element and we traveled the country doing two things. One, selling to retail stores, because that's what we thought okay, you should do. Yeah, start a retail sure. company, you sell the retail stores. Right. We had never done it before, but that's what everybody <laughs> says you have to do. Uh -huh. The other thing that we did that was interesting, however, is that while we were on that trip, in addition, we thought our main business was selling these, you know, into stores. Yeah. What ended up happening is that we would do these trunk shows in people's homes. So at night, oh, and during the day, okay. we would be hustling, we'd be yeah. pounding the pavement, we'd be going to boutiques, we'd yeah. be talking to buyers, and then every night, we would be doing a trunk show in someone's home, mainly people's homes that we were staying in, yeah. sleeping in. You guys, <laughs> we, we lived out of our car for six months, and in six months, we only stayed in a hotel one night. Oh, my word. And every other night, it, we either were sleeping in our car, or we were sleeping in the home of someone who hosted a <laughs> trunk show, and after they hosted a trunk show, bonus, they got the two founders sleeping on their couch. Or on the floor of their living room. I mean, that's a pretty amazing behind the scenes glimpse into that. Woo! <laughs> Y'all, it was wild. That's and it was crazy. the hardest, most intense. I mean, I would wake up in the morning and literally just be like, okay. Because it would be like we'd wake up at six, and then literally our night wouldn't end until probably midnight because we'd have the trunk show. And then after the trunk show, when you're sleeping in someone's home, you feel a lot of pressure to like hang out with them totally. and like, you know, tell them yeah. more about the story yeah. and give them the insider notes. It was so exhausting, but it was amazing. Bria has a question. Has a question. Right? Oh, I just had a comment from Catherine Canoodle. She says, I love how HQ listens and asks us fellows and we are truly part of Seiko on a deeper level. Yes, and we, um, remind me of that comment, Bri, because we're going to get a little bit more into that as well. So, so anyway, all that to be said, we kind of thought the Trump show was just like bonus, like yeah. grassroots. Sure. We're already in these different cities. Let's spread the word. Let's yeah. get people excited about yeah. it. Um, so we continue building our business through wholesale and online for the next six years, mm -hmm. doing that kind of like whatever we have to do to sell sandals. Mm -hmm. All of our focus and time and energy and passion is going towards Africa. Okay. And it's going towards like building a manufacturing company in a country that doesn't have manufacturing yet. Yeah and really perfecting and iterating and changing our impact model yeah. to make sure the impact that we say we want to have, we're actually having, yeah. you know, training our people and running what we hoped would eventually become a best in class manufacturing company in Uganda. So about two years ago, we hit some pretty major milestones. Ben and I had two 10 decade goals when okay. we started Seiko. So we said, we think it's going to take us 10 years and we're going to be laser focused on eventually owning our own factory. So we own the she land, did. we build the yeah. factory. A lot of fair trade models um, buy finished good products from producers, and we're a really big fan of that model as well, but yeah. there's some pretty key differences, and we can talk more about that, of why we want it to be completely vertically integrated and actually own our own production, okay. which is really rare, not only in fair trade, but in the fashion industry in general. Yeah, getting lots of love. Very few people. Aaron says, woohoo! Very, very, very few people. Oh, yeah. Because it's not easy, right? Because it's not easy, you guys. If you're thinking about starting a manufacturing company, talk to me. No, just kidding. We love it. It's the best thing. I mean, it's yeah. like we the, the fruit of our labor yeah. over the last decade has paid off, but it took 100% of our time and effort. So about a couple of, two years ago, we opened the doors to our fully owned factory. Amazing. And our other really big 10-year goal was we want our Ugandan company to be run by Ugandans. We want it to be a Ugandan company. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have a ton of Americans that yeah. are over there running the company, creating the culture, overseeing. Like yeah. We really believe in our Ugandan brothers and sisters, and we want to enable them to have executive positions and for them to be the managers and for them to be the ones that are leading our team. Again, about two years ago, we sent our last American home, and we had a fully Ugandan That's management amazing. team. The hardest thing we've ever done. Yeah. Uh, the, mo the thing I'm most proud of yeah. at Seiko to date. Yeah. Uh, so we have this incredible team. So it kind of gave Ben and I some space to sit back and say, man, we've accomplished these like massive goals in right. Uganda. We're over here doing our business in the U.S., like, and, and, and we kind of sat back and we asked a really, really dangerous question, which any of you who want to stay out of trouble – or you want to live an easy life, I'm going to encourage you to never ask this question. Are you ready for this? <laughs> I'm excited. The question is, this is good. That's a statement. Statement in question. This is good. Could it be even better? And by this is good, I mean our retail model. This is good. Selling into stores and selling online and investing yeah. into AdWords and e-com, 
spending our money going to trunk shows in Vegas, which, by the way, I hated. Ben and I would always get really depressed the few weeks after we were home from a trade show that it was just like, this is not what we envisioned for our life. Like, going to trade shows, it's just like an interesting, weird scene that we weren't excited about. But again, it was the means to an end. We'll do it if it means employing women in Uganda. And we started really dreaming about saying, like, hey, in the same way that we hijacked the production and manufacturing model, which typically wants to keep the producers as invisible as possible, to use them as much as possible, to get as much out of them as you can, to keep your prices, you know, to run your business more profitably. We're saying, like, nope, we're hijacking that model. We want the producers to be the center of the story. Um, We want to connect them with radical transparency to people here in the U.S. Yeah. What if we applied that same kind of hijack mentality to our retail that's scary. Model. <laughs> what if, you know, like, what if we decided to turn up the retail side of things yeah. upside down, and instead of uh, participating in kind of par for the course retail, we yeah. completely we used our retail model to create community and opportunity for women here in the U.S. Um, and yes. Alyssa says, "What if?" And Tirza says, "Ask dangerous questions." Ask dangerous <laughs> questions. Read good books and ask hard <laughs> questions. That's a tenet of the Seiko Manifesto. So long story short, long story long actually, that led us to asking the question of what's the need for women and girls in the U.S. and how could our retail model suit those needs? And one of the things that came back was this overwhelming sense, I mean there is a groundswell of women in the U.S. who over the last decade have seen the rise of impact entrepreneurship, Uh using business and your time and your skills and your talent to make an impact in the world, but for some reason or another, uh, we're not in the moment impact entrepreneurs. I don't know if that's because they didn't have an idea, they didn't have a service that they sure. created, they didn't have a background in business, they didn't have access to capital, sure. they didn't feel like they had the community or the support that they needed to do that. I was getting, literally, and still do, so many emails a week from people saying, I heard the Seiko story, I'm so inspired by it, I want to be an impact entrepreneur, but I have no idea where to start. Yeah. Could you? Spend 30 minutes with me on Skype and yeah. help me get started. As much as I would love to do that, right. completely <laughs> unsustainable for me to spend 30 minutes yeah. trying to help people start businesses. Really. So Ben and I really sat at the table and we were like, is there a way for us to, there's so much energy. Yeah. And so, and, and that made, was thrilling to us that there are women that were really? even thinking about this. Yeah. Could we create a model that would help channel that energy into community, into opportunity? And the crazy thing that happened is we realized like, yeah. Basically, <laughs> instead of selling into stores and selling online, we put the brand and the product and the tools in the hands of individual women, of impact entrepreneurs, so that they can start and grow and sometimes scale for, for those of our, uh, our, our bosses uh-huh. in the community, their own impact enterprises. Oh. Um, so that's kind of where we started. And then we really worked backwards, and then we discovered direct sales, essentially. Gosh, we were like, yeah. there's actually a model that already <laughs> exists. Yeah. It kind of does this, but a little different. But a little differently, okay, and we so, had a lot of that. Yeah, so, okay, so okay. on that, so since you're talking about the model, yes. I just want yes. to address the elephant. Let's business. talk about <laughs> the elephant. Yeah, because I, I mean, from my experience growing up, the model of direct sales and the model of MLMs was like super frowned upon by. Myself even because I thought of it all as a pyramid scheme. Yep. So can, <laughs> magical word. Can pyramid you explain schemes. to me? Because I'm like in my head, there's like make money, there's people under you. Yep. What is is there a difference? Yes. What is the difference? So this is actually a great question because there's a really black and white answer. Okay. There there's like a lot of legal things that have had there's an actual legal definition of a pyramid scheme. So what is that? So basically here's here if anybody ever accuses <laughs> you of being a part of a pyramid scheme, you can answer them in a very educated way. Here's what makes a pyramid scheme. One, um, the company basically makes money and can profit by just selling the initial investment. For us that would be our starter kit. So That's we good. sell to fellows a starter kit of samples that then they use to go out and to sell the products uh-huh. to solicit orders. If we were a pyramid scheme, that would mean, even if, if we're selling these kits, and if, if the only thing that people ever do is just buy the kits, we would like be doing okay. As a company. I actually asked our finance director yesterday, I was like, ballpark, like, how long do you think Seiko would survive if all we did was sell starter kits? Yeah. And he was like, well, I mean, I'd have to do the math, but three or four weeks. Like, I mean, it's just like, it, it's not, we don't profit off of it. Okay. It's, it's like, it's a, we basically sell these at cost, like yeah. we're making no money off of it. So if our fellows weren't going on to be successful, we would be screwed as a company. Gotcha. Um, now, 
we actually love that because what that does is all of our motivation goes into like, yeah, yeah, you got to sell the starter kit. You have to invest in a business to build a business. However, if we're not investing in you, if we're not walking alongside of you, if we're not providing you with the community and the support that you need to be successful, we as a company will not be successful. Um, that sets us apart from a lot of other sure. okay. companies so in the industry. So then our main difference from a pyramid is that we actually can't survive unless our people are thriving. Yep. The, the other definition, um, and other, and this is similar, is that you cannot make money without recruiting essentially oh, down Okay. People. Yeah, that's the other side. That's, that's the other side. Of it. That's the, the other side. Um, and y'all, that's just, any of you guys who know about Safeco know that we have set up the core of our system and the core of our compensation plan and our structure um, is to, and one of the, the phrases that we use a lot is to create a seat at the table for everyone. Yeah. So that means if you are a woman who, you're a stay-at-home mom and you've got two girls under the age of, you know, four, and you want to be a part of the community, you want to use what little extra time that you have and maybe post a trunk show or two a month and never recruit anybody. Right. Great. There is a place for you at the table. Cool. We so have a pathway for you. There you will be celebrated in our community. Now, on the other hand, if you are a big boss and you're yeah. like, my dream is I want to be a CEO. I want to be an impact entrepreneur. I want to grow an organization. Yeah. We have a pathway for you. We yeah. have a pathway towards success where you can actually create tons of impact. Yeah. Build a team build an organization, but there is a seat for everybody at the table. And in fact, over 80% of fellows today have never recruited somebody. They're building their own businesses. And they're being they're successful. Selling, and they're being That's successful. Cool. Yes. So that is the definition. Uh, yes, Bree has a question. So Jenna noted this is shockingly similar to what we do in Uganda. Give them the tools, the opportunity, and teach them, and they can run with it. And um, Hope says, once you buy the kit, then you can't help but fall in love with Seiko. <laughs> and Catherine says, but really, the products sell themselves. It's We are going to talk so about the product life so giving because that is also something I really, truly believe sets us really apart. So that being said, uh, direct sales is a structure. It's a company structure. Uh -huh. Any company structure, in my mind, it, a company structure is amoral. And by amoral, I mean it's neither good nor bad. Right. It's like, here's the skeleton, and then it's up to you to clothe it, to put the muscles on, to put the skin on. Mm -hmm. What I love about our journey, in some ways, has been a lot harder than probably someone who has a ton of experience in the industry, because we're learning everything from <laughs> scratch. But what's been amazing is that we're just doing it the Seiko way, yeah. and it's like, we're not doing it even necessarily to be different, but it's like, as we've been doing it differently, what we're realizing is that it is really it's different. really it's really different. We didn't even know better. We a lot of the things were like, no, we just assume everybody does it this way. This is just like the decent and good and right thing sure. to do. And then sure. people are like, oh, you do that? And we're like, yeah. Do other people no not? Really? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I mean, with that is one thing that I've noticed is really different is sort of this culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've only been with Seiko for a couple months, and I've been able to interact with fellows. I've been able to be in very close quarters with them and sort of interact with them online. And I feel like the culture that I've experienced at Seiko is so different. It's crazy from my it's from other people that I know who are maybe part of direct sales, but it's a very um, isolated experience, mm -hmm. or maybe even competitive. Or mm -hmm. I feel like the culture at Seiko is super different. And I don't know everything, but I know culture is not accidental. Yes, at least healthy culture is it's never so accidental. What? Do you feel like there is a strategy or things that HQ does yes. to make sure that this happens? So much strategy. Okay, so what is it? <laughs> yes. I like it. And like, I, I, love your, I love your acknowledgement that culture, and you guys, if you are leaders, you have to understand this. You have to own it. You have to be crazy and dogmatic about it. Culture does not, good culture, culture happens yeah. no matter what you do. Good culture yeah. is never an accident. It requires intentionality. It requires putting things into place that are a manifestation of your values. Um, and so, yeah, we spend so much. I mean, if time is money, the amount of resources that we spend on the HQ side of things saying, how do we create the culture that we're dreaming about is, is pretty significant. So a couple things that we do. Um, one thing, if you want to become a Seiko Fellow, you have to apply and once you apply, you have to actually go through an, an on-the-phone or in-person interview with a member of HQ. Um, we have had people in the industry, big, big-time players, who said, you can't do that. You can't do that. Like, your goal is, like, get people to buy the kits. Get people to buy the kits. 
that is a huge barrier to entry that's keeping people, you know, if, if, if all you want to do is funnel them into the click buy now, get them to buy your kit, and then we'll figure out if they're going to be successful later. Gotcha. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we said, like, nope, we love this. We're not going to do that. And the reason that we do that is because we want to create a culture of women who are like-minded, a culture of women who belong at Seiko. Mm -hmm. Um, if we sense in an interview that someone thinks that they're going to get something out of Seiko that's not realistic, that's yeah. not really what we do, yeah. that's not the culture we really promote, it's a great time for us to be able to say, hey, we wish you all the luck in the world. Here are maybe some organizations that you should check out. Or actually, it's not a great financial strategy for you right now. You know, Whereas a lot of other companies, um, they don't care. Right. They don't care, and it's not about finding. It's about finding someone who's going to buy stuff not about creating this mutually beneficial right. partnership right. now I will say part of our culture I think is created it's pretty self-selective right we have women that are applying in the first place yeah to become fellows that it's like they kind of get they kind of get it what Seiko is they care about education they're for women being yeah. for women they yeah. care about ethical fashion they want to go to Uganda and like visit a manufacturing yeah. in Uganda and learn how things are made all of the things about who Seiko is only speaks to a certain, you know, there are millions of women in the country that are like, I'm not into that. I don't want that. I'd rather, you know, get a fancy car or go on a, you know, fancy and vacation. Fine. And that's totally yeah. fine. But we attract a very specific yeah. woman who says, no, I want to be an impact entrepreneur. And I want to have a global understanding of the world. And I want to meet sisters who are like sassy and spicy and like, a really interesting statistic, I think, is that over 75% of Seiko Fellows have never done direct sales before. And I think that that's really interesting because I think that there's an entire world of women who want to be entrepreneurs, but who haven't found the right fit in the direct sales space for them. And Seiko is the place where they're finding that fit. Other like-minded women. Um, and so a huge part of our culture, I think, has just been created because it's like, we're a pretty unique group yeah. of women who yeah. have all found each other. Yeah. And sometimes that feels like magic, but it's like <laughs> my whole life, you know, I've been looking for women who think that the same things I think are yeah. funny and care about things happening globally and who are interested in ethical fashion. And so in some ways there is kind of this sense that we've, uh, that we found our people. Yeah. Okay. Bri, Bri has a yeah. Lots of love coming in about the interview process and HQ's investment into our culture. And, um, Shonda also asked how many fellows we currently uh, we have about 350 active fellows right amazing. now, which is amazing. So cool. Yeah, yeah. I, okay, so the interviewing thing is amazing. Yes. But I have a question about the next step. So we get that amazing women are self-selectors, come to Seiko, get the culture. But the next step of that, and what, where I feel like MLMs get a bad rep, is the whole, like, then they have to sell to their friends. Mm -hmm. Is that awkward? Where do you go from there? Is Great. Seiko any different in that? Um, yes and no. Okay. So, yes, I'm going to say no first. Okay. No, in the sense that, and I'm actually going to back up a little bit and talk about how similar, and I think my perspective is different because I'm an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. So I have this background of I've started and grown in, in the process yeah. of scaling a company. Never could have done that. I mean, when I was starting Seiko the first three years, I relied on my, I relied, I had to capitalize every piece of social capital that I had, right? <laughs> yeah. Where it was like my mom, my mom's friends. My first trunk show was hosted by my sister and her, she was my first hostess yeah. essentially. She brought 20 of her college friends over and this was before we were a direct sales company. Sure. When we had to find an accountant, but we couldn't afford an accountant. When we needed legal advice, but we couldn't, we didn't have in-house legal counsel. Yeah. All of these things. Being an entrepreneur, I've never met an entrepreneur who hasn't figured out how to capitalize their oh. capital. It's an integral part of being a business person. So here's the thing. I'm not going to sit here and be like, no, you'll never have to ask anybody for anything and stuff is just going to fly out of the shelves. Like, y'all, if people are telling you that about their opportunity, they just want you to buy the kit and then you're screwed. Yeah, yeah. Because if you want to be an entrepreneur, like, you kind of have to be brave and you have to be bold okay. and you have to put yourself out there. 100% of the things that you want in your life will not happen. If you do not verbalize them, if you do not strategize about them, if you do not get after them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our culture and a lot of what we talk about and promote and encourage one another on is that like, yeah, if you want to do anything, in the, I've never met not only an entrepreneur, uh, a, a designer, a, yeah. a founder of a nonprofit, someone in policy that hasn't gone like, yeah, I figured out how to leverage yeah. relationships and connections and not in a bad, like I don't feel in 
ounce of shame yeah. over what I had to do to get Seiko started because I honestly feel, and I feel this for every fellow, that it was like, and I saw this, I was blown away over and over again, that I would come to somebody feeling like I was asking for something, and what I ended up realizing is that I was actually giving them an opportunity. I was, it's mission driven. It's I was giving them an opportunity to be a part of the story. I was giving them an opportunity to use their gifts and their skills and their connections. I actually just had a call with one of my mentors on Sunday, and she asked me specifically. She was basically like, "Liz, I feel like you haven't asked me of any asked me for anything in a long time." That bums me out. She's like, "You know that one of my favorite things to do in life is I want to see you succeed." I want to use my network and my connections and my knowledge to help you. Like, don't withhold that. Like, please, yeah. can you kick it back up yeah. a notch? And that, to me, is like, I have found so many more people. Now, here's where it goes wrong. It goes wrong when people feel used. Yeah. It feels wrong when it's, like, really scammy. It feels really wrong when it's super one-sided, of, like, you're not going to get anything out of this or there's going to be a cost to you. Um, so a lot of what we do in the fellows community is to talk about how do we leverage our relationships and our community and our connection and knowledge, but do that in a way that is like dignified. One of our core tenets is dignity yeah. is the spark that gives way to a flame. Like I do not just believe that our women in Uganda deserve dignity. I believe that every single person you interact with, whether that's a hostess, whether that's a customer, whether that's the UPS man that's delivering the products, like deserves dignity. And if someone is... Uh, deserves dignity like we don't use them we don't spam them yeah. we don't like guilt them into doing things we don't yeah. like manipulate them into a situation and then take advantage yeah. of them um, but it's 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 sad to me that we've equated that with direct sales because again direct sales is just the structure yeah. and then within that we get to say here's how we yeah. do things differently I think <laughs> I just remember this the other day a, a friend of mine who um, works for a different direct sales company was and she's amazing she was a little disappointed because she told me that she was going through training and the verbiage was do your best to appear genuine when you're talking to people about this. And she and she texted me, actually no, we were talking and she was like, Wait, don't they want me to be like be genuine? And I was like, Yeah, like maybe they need to rethink that. So I think I need mean, to, to go along with your point of just like people will sense when you're being authentic and treating them um, with as much dignity as you are treating the women in Uganda. Sure. Or, or. Yeah, and it's really what has been so fun, especially now that we've been around for a little bit and the culture is starting to take hold and there's a community and there's impact happening, is that literally all our fellows have to do is speak the truth. Yeah. Speak truth about their experience, speak truth about the community, speak truth about the impact, and it just radiates a mm -hmm. level of passion. Um, and I think to be really honest and frank, I think the fact that we're so mission-driven puts us in a different category. Yeah. You know, I'm just going to be really frank and say it feels really different to invite someone into what we're doing than it does, I think, to um, sell a product that there's no real connection to anything other than the actual product. I'm not saying that that's bad. Sure. And for some people, that works. But there's other people that that doesn't work for, myself included. I don't yeah. think I ever could have been a part of another direct sales company, yeah. but now I'm, like, crazy in love with this specific model. So for yeah. us it is, it's really about finding the women that feel that sense of like, I need something a little bit more, I need something a little bit more impact yeah. that, that really aligns not just with maybe a benefit that I receive from a product, mm -hmm. but like a deep, in your gut, fire in the belly belief about how mm -hmm. the world should work, mm -hmm. and um, that's the community that we're creating. Mm -hmm. And Alyssa adds, don't need to be spammy with verbiage or gimmicks. The story sells itself. We just have to put it out there. Yes. Just and that that Alyssa and she would um, phrase that perfectly because there were two parts to that. One, you don't have to be gimmicky. You don't have to be dishonest. You do have to get out there and put yeah. it out there because <laughs> no one can know the story. Right. No one can be invited if right. you're not the one that's inviting them in. And that is our entire ethos in our community. Yes. We have another question that kind of throw back, went, yeah. throws back to what we were talking about before. How do we decide on how to price the kits? Ooh. It's basically just priced 100% off of the price of, of the goods, essentially. So we're not, uh, we add up everything that's in the kits, and basically our cost of what it costs us to make that and get it shipped to the U.S. is what we're charging for that. So I don't know the details, but it's like our $299 kit has at least twice, if not three times, the like seven hundred. It's worth like seven hundred dollars worth of product. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's really easy for us actually.
And yeah. Aaron says, I love it as a company. We are an open book. You don't have, um, we don't have anything to hide. And I love it, Aaron. And to the point that come visit us in Uganda. We yeah. Have an open door yes. policy. I think one of, uh, one of the things that probably, and this isn't just direct sales that sets us apart from really any fashion company is when people are like, well, I want to see it for myself. We go, great. Yeah. Tell us when you want to visit. We'd love to have you. And host you. Yeah. That's very unusual. Yes. Yeah. One of the other things that I want to talk about from a structure standpoint, yeah. um, I'm not sure if this is fact, so I can have fact checkers. I'm pretty sure we're the only direct sales company in the world that does this. Um, we actually have a recruiting cap. Um, we have a cap that we put on the amount of people that a fellow can recruit in a single month and the amount of people that as a company we are willing to take on in a single month. Wow. Um, again, so many people in the industry, big wigs, big hitters, have told us, why that's suicide? Why are you doing that? Yeah. The point you want to make something viral. Right. You want to create a flash in the pan. You want to go from having a hundred consultants to a hundred thousand consultants in nine months, mm -hmm. because then you can sell it to you know you can exit. You can sell it to a private equity firm. You know for twice the revenue valuation and like whatever happens to those people, like bless right. their hearts, but like hope they do well. But right. kind of not 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 your concern. Y'all, sustainable growth is one of the most important pillars to what we do at Seiko. Now, here's the thing. I'm not saying we don't want to be big. I want to be big, and I have no apologies about yeah. that. I think that there's kind of this misnomer that small is good, and I don't buy into that specifically when it relates to impact, right? Because right. it's like the bigger we are, the more women I get to employ in Uganda, the more uh, women I get to work with in the U.S., mm -hmm. like the, the more profit we have to do, like, insane, awesome, cool, like generous, innovative thing. So make no mistake, Seiko will be the largest, most well-known, ethical, mission-driven direct sales company in the world. Someone write that down? It will be, it will be. <laughs> However, is that gonna happen next year? Is that gonna happen three years from now? Is that gonna happen five years from now? The answer to that is like, no. I'm literally thinking about Seiko 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 100 years from now. I'm thinking about the next generation of leaders. I'm thinking about the women who are starting Seiko today or who are starting Seiko tomorrow or two years from now. How are we as a company making sure that their investment and that their business that they've built over the long term um, is doesn't go out the window when the company experiences explosive growth? I was reading a statistic about um, – Women who started, there were 10,000 consultants. Within nine months, there was 90,000 consultants. And in her town of 15,000 people, there were 15 consultants, right? Wow. And so um, to me, that's a real ethics question of like, you have invested in us. You've built a business. Yeah. What am I doing as the company owner yeah. and founder to make sure that we're all winning, that, yeah. that our growth on the HQ side is only going to benefit you and your growth yeah. and your business yeah. and the life that you're building for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes, free. So we got some love from Caroline. She says, heck yeah, about the growth in Uganda. And Caroline would know yeah. because she went to Uganda <laughs> with us. And I wanted to read, um, Jesse has a comment here that I love. She said, I tried getting into several other companies, but found myself searching for how I could make it mean something to me and who I would market to. And in the end, never stayed committed. I just joined a week ago and I've been overwhelmed Yay! with passion and can't wait to share your mission with everyone I know. Yay, we love that. Okay, Thank can you. I also come and say what just happened there with Liz and I on the same note? <laughs> no, actually, every time someone comes on the team, I think this, I've never worked for another direct sales company, but it's so genuinely, like, energizing and exciting to us to know that a woman has joined this mission. Yeah. And we ring a bell and we all we freak do. out. <laughs> because by the time she gets to us, she's not just a random person who bought a kid online. Like, she's talked to someone on the phone. She's talked to someone on the phone. There's a really good chance that we got a daily recap email that had an excerpt from her application that we found really yeah. inspiring. Like, it's like the mentality is like, yay, there's yeah. a new sister. There's a new yeah. friend that we get to get to do this yeah. with. Yes, great. Um, Monique also says, uh, what's it going to take to bring fellows on to the international score, which Monique, we know that you are <laughs> on the forefront of. She, she's going to start Seiko Brazil, maybe? I love it. Wow. Yeah. And I, honestly, <laughs> Brazil would be an amazing market for Seiko 1. Um, Monique, it's going to happen. I'll tell you what's going to happen. I tell, I'll tell you what's going to need to happen is we need to continue. We are growing at a really healthy, good, sustainable pace here in the States. We need to keep that up for the next couple years. 
And then the cool thing about our job here at, at HQ is going out and finding untapped markets for our product and for our brand because what we don't want to do is just oversaturate our existing fellows in the areas because that's where a lot of companies go. I mean, I was reading statistics about this company that went from having, I think it was 120,000 sellers in their peak, like four years after starting, and then the next year they were down to 40. Wow. You know why that happens? It happens because that explosive growth is not sustainable. The market can't, you know, consume that. Now, does that mean that I don't want to have that many fellows? No, it means we're going to be really smart about making sure we're getting into markets and we're pursuing yeah. untapped markets yeah. that are going to create overall growth of the business, um, not just cannibalize uh, the areas that we've already established. So, Monique, once we do that, we're going global and you know that uh, we, we know that you'll have probably a hand <laughs> in building our sisterhood in Brazil, which I love. So as far as how how the fellows actually are growing, I mean, talked about the fact that we're growing sustainably in the recruiting, but how, what does Seiko do to make sure that a woman is able to grow in her own business financially mm -hmm. outside of recruiting? Mm -hmm. Great question. For us, there's two things. Um, the first is support. Uh, the level of, so we assume that people are coming in. Again, 75% of women in our community have never been a part of direct sales, right? So there's not, we can't even trick ourselves into believing like, oh, they just buy the kit and we send them the products. The products sell themselves, right? How many times have Nothing we heard sells. that? Nothing, <laughs> that is really nice. Nothing does that. It can be the best product in the world. Yeah. It needs a salesman. Yeah. It needs woman, saleswoman. Um, that's how the world, that's how the world works. And yeah. so, what I think we have going for us is we don't feel bad about saying that. Of like, oh yeah, you're gonna get this kit and then you're gonna have to sell it. And we start from square one, assuming that you really have no idea what that means. Yeah. And so really, I mean, part of our process and part of our hope, when we sat down at the table and we dreamed about the fellows program, I remember saying this. I was like, I want the fellows to be something that, you know, in 10 years, in 15 years, is so well known for the caliber of the experience mm -hmm. um, that if a fellow decided after 10 years of building her Seiko business or two years of being involved, or maybe she was in college and she was you know, a, a college fellow and she wanted to go on to start her own impact um, yeah. enterprise or she wanted to go work for another company, that um, a potential investor would hear about her experience and they would go, oh, you were a Seiko fellow. Okay, that gives me a pretty good understanding of where you're coming from. I know that you know how to sell, how to network, how to do events, how to do customer service, how to do budgeting, and you know um, all of the all of the things that we take a, a lot of um, pride and care to yeah. train our fellows in. Yeah. Um, that to me is like I want there to be a best in class yeah. experience um, and support. And again, for every woman, it's depending on what her race is. And by race, I don't mean ethnicity. I mean the race that she's running. Sure. Uh, okay. That's one of the phrases that we use is kind of like run your own race. There's no prescribed view of success. Sure. For what success looks like for one woman is going to look vastly different. Um, but for our women that are big bosses that are yeah. saying, like, I'm, I'm really high capacity and I'm, like, pretty talented and I'm a real go-getter and I'm ready to channel that go-getter energy into being, like, a high-caliber yeah. impact entrepreneur – we are obsessed with our mentors. Our mentors are basically our team builders. They are the women that are saying, not only do I want to sell and build yeah. my business, but I want to invite other women into the journey. I want to help pour into them and help them create yeah. success. These are women that will go on, we all, to create organizations. Mm -hmm. Organizations bigger than what I'm running now, which yeah. is really fun for yeah. me to think, right? Like, globally, how many employees do I have? You know, counting all of our contractors and everything, a few hundred. And there's something thrilling to me about knowing that we have women on our team today and women that have not started that will have teams of hundreds of people, if not thousands of people, which is going to require a level of high caliber leadership and learning and mentorship. We meet with our mentors one on one. We do, um, you know, a, a special training series. We meet together starting this January for an in-person leadership summit that's only for those women who, are, who want to build a team, they want to build an organization. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the difference, I think one of the differences, like, our fellows aren't brand reps. Yeah. Our fellows are not salespeople. Um, our fellows are, specifically our mentor fellows, and you know who you are if I've said this to you before, you are the CEO of your team. 
right? Like my job and your job actually are not that much different. At some point, you transition out of, um, not completely out of selling and hosting yeah. shows, because actually one of the things that makes us different is that we actually require that our leaders do the work, that our, our leaders are doing what they're asking their people to do and they're yeah. setting an example by that. But that being said, way more of their energy is going to be going into training and mentoring and culture building, hello, all of the things that we do at totally. HQ, yeah. than um, you know, going, to, going to a vendor event. Yeah. Um, and so, but for the women that are on that different track, they may do that, and that may be their like thing that they get really, really good at, and sure. they do amazing truck sure. shows, and they have awesome experiences. So it really depends on who are you, what's your vision for success, yeah. and then kind of pick a track, and then Seiko is going to be all in. Okay, so, which I love that you're excited about mentors, but I have to ask, yes. because of my past perception yes. of MLM. Yes. So when I hear you talking about mentors and leaders, basically they are making their money by signing people up under them. Mm. Right? Yes. <laughs> now, you okay. guys may have expected me to be like, no, 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 let me explain. If the question is, do our mentors make money when their people that they're recruited make money? Mm. The answer is unequivocally, unashamedly, like, yes, <laughs> of course they do. Like, this is not a charity. Yeah. I'm not going out looking for women to spend tons of their time and energy and money like busting their butts to train and to I mean our mentors they come to your first trunk show they're on the phone with you they're available to answer your questions they're walking you through they're doing sales training they're helping you think about your pre-book strategy and your budgeting like I'm sorry if I think it's wrong and immoral to have a woman in Uganda make your sandals and not be paid fairly for it I, as the leader of this company, think it is equally wrong and immoral to say, like, hey, can you train all of these people and get them to sell uh, our product and help our company be more successful <laughs> without them benefiting right. financially? So that is one of the parts where it's like, wait, remind me again why, why that gets a bad rap. Right. Now, I'll tell you, here's where it gets a bad rap. Where it gets a bad rap is when a leader in direct sales can make money and benefit when her team is not benefiting. And here's how that happens. Um, there are structures and there are companies. Here's, here's the real difference, in, and I want you to hear what I'm saying here. There are companies that incentivize buying, yeah. and there are companies that incentivize selling. By nature, if your company incentivizes buying, there's a really good chance that you will get taken advantage of. Incentivizes you to be buying? Yes. As a seller? They're sellers to be buyers, okay. right? So there are companies where it's like, okay, Ella, you're a leader, you're a coach, or you're a mentor, mm -hmm. you're gonna get a bonus, but you're only gonna get a bonus if the woman underneath you buys more inventory this month. Mm -hmm. She hits her buying quota. Okay. She buys X amount of units from me, Liz yeah. Inc., this month. So yeah. then what ends up happening is uh, you've got some real mixed motive situations, right? Yeah. So you're like, well, I want to make my $500 bonus. Yeah. I see my my downline, if you will, the woman that I've recruited. She's actually really struggling. She's not selling well. Um, and what I'm going to tell her to do, because I really need her to buy 20 more yeah. units, I really need her to hit her three month, you know, $300 a month minimum, is I'm going to say, hey, I think you'll be a lot more successful if you buy a little bit more. You see how ooh, that is? You see how, and I'm not saying every person or leader in that um, structure would take advantage of that, but it really sets your people up sure. for a conflict sure. of interest. Whereas at Seiko, 100%, no questions asked, we only incentivize selling. Meaning if your downline comes to you and she's struggling with her yeah. trunk shows, you never, ever, ever, I'd smack you upside the face if you told if you told that fellow she just needs to buy more inventory, right. that would be a major no-no. We would never do that. We would say, okay, let's talk about how you're telling the story. Yeah. Let's talk about your why. Let's talk about how many products are you actually showing. Maybe you need to narrow it down and focus yeah. in on just the top three products that you love. Yeah. All of these different strategies, because that's what a coach does. It helps you get better yeah. at your job. It doesn't encourage you to buy stuff that you don't mm -hmm. need. So one thing I think it is so important to note, Beyond the initial investment yeah. of your starter kit, you will never be required or asked to buy anything else ever again from Seiko, and you will be successful.
nothing. Now there's opportunity for it. We do yeah. this really cool thing called pre-book, which is where I basically announce the, the upcoming line um, to our fellows. Not only do they get to vote on everything that goes into the next line, so this is a really that cool part of, um, and we can talk more about this, but the Seiko fellows are literally, they're my people, they're my team, they're my like, co-creators. So I say, I want to build a company and a product line and a system that works for you. Help me understand what works for you. Yeah. And so one really clear way that we do that is through pre-book. So our fellows get to decide, my customer will love this. Seiko's going to make this next year. So they get to buy all of those products at 50% off, which is amazing. Yeah. And notice when they sell those products, they get to keep 100% of that 50%, right? So if you buy it from me for $10, you sell it to your customer for 20, you get to keep 100% of that $10. It's an amazing opportunity for our women who want to invest more, yeah. who have started making money with Seiko, who are very business minded, who are saying, I really want to invest. Do you have to participate in pre sale? No. Should everybody participate in pre sale? Maybe not. I want to tell you an anecdote. We got a, um, the first time we ever did pre sale, we had an order come through. It was like for $6,000. And it was because we know all of our fellows, we were like, she's a, she's, she has a full-time job. We know her vision for Seiko, and it's uh, to be pretty part-time. Yeah. She's really interested in the mission. Da, 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 da. This isn't right. She's getting in over her head. This mm -hmm. is not a great strategy for her. We literally called her up on the phone, and we were like, we love your enthusiasm. We're so excited about having you on the team. Let's rethink your pre-book. No. We don't think that you need... We don't think that you need as much as you may think that you need. Now, can we have a commitment at HQ to doing that as we're growing? No, of course not. But I think that that anecdote is really illustrative of the spirit of we only, we don't want people to get that. their heads. And that out. is how we're training our mentors to look out for their people. And so if we ever heard a mentor that was going, they're going to fly off the shelves and everyone's going to love it and you're going to get really rich really fast, so buy as much as you can possibly afford and max out your credit cards and blah, 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 blah. We would be like, you're done. You're out. <laughs> no questions asked, actually. Well, we would have a conversation with them and then if they kept doing it, yes, yeah. what we would do. Not a great fit. Not a great fit for Seiko. This isn't really our community and how we're, we're valuing those. Um, Which, as far as I know, that's never happened. All the women who have become mentors no. are, like, so yeah. amazing. Yes. And, and by the time you get to that level. We know you so well that yeah. it would be crazy for something like that. Yeah. To yes, totally. Um, but that's just an illustration of how, I think, how different yeah. our model is yeah. and how we're thinking. I think we had a question or two. Um, yeah, so a few few comments. Lots of love for all of our mentors. Yay! A few, like many comments ago, we had fellows who were claiming territories for when we move internationally. <laughs> um, Hope says, I also appreciate that the strategy is not to maximize money we spend, but instead to make wise choices. Yeah. No to debt. Yeah, and just knowing that, like, we want you guys to be phenomenal salespeople and man you can sell and you can hone in on your side you can tell a beautiful story and you can provide amazing customer service and we want to lead with that and then your sales pick up and so you're placing more orders or you're buying more inventory or whatever your specific strategy is um, but that it never starts with buy more stuff never ever ever okay so I okay so the mentors I get it now yeah They're amazing yeah um all of the stuff that we're selling, I want to get like to the heart of it. Mm. The product itself. The product itself. I feel like MLMs have this rep of selling kind of like kitschy products that aren't that cool that people actually don't need. And so that's why they recruit people to try to like sell them to their friends. So can you speak to Seiko's product line and how we do that differently? Or I can. I don't know if I can do it in a way that feels really unbiased. <laughs> As you're wearing, like, <laughs> as, I mean, jacked out, as you know, yeah. because, um, y'all, the products that we make are off the charts. Mm -hmm. I mean, our sandals have been have been featured in Vogue magazine yeah. or, you know, re basically every major general women's interest for, and not really for the mission so much as, like, these are great on-trend yeah. sandals that every woman should have in her wardrobe. The way that I'm thinking about our product line is you know a lot of the reason that we've kind of diversified over the last year or so is because I never want people buying more of something than they need. Yeah. Um, that being said, this is a crazy statistic. The average woman in America, specifically under the age of 30, over the age of 30 it's 125, under the age of 30 it's 200. So let's average it out at 150. The average woman in America in her lifetime 
will spend $150,000 on clothing and accessories. Wow. That, that exists. Whether I go, like, be a trash woman or, you know, like, decide to start selling my famous pancakes. Yeah. I have no famous pancakes. <laughs> so like, um, regardless of Seiko, that number exists in the world. Yeah. Our goal at Seiko is not to increase that number. Mm. Our goal is to help people reframe how they think about that number and buy differently within mm -hmm. that context. So I think the, the number um, under that $150,000 is like the average woman, what was it? It was like 175 purses. We yeah, about handbags, yeah. It's like 100, that, that means that over her lifetime she'll own 175 yeah. handbags. So we're saying like, hey, maybe if you think about this more thoughtfully and you're really strategic about your style and how you use your products and the materials that are being used, we get that down to you own 100 handbags over yeah. the course of your life. and. 99 of them are Seiko. <laughs> um, so it's really more about like the market share already exists. We yeah. want to change how customers think about their purchasing. And then we want to do that in a way that feels absolutely no compromises. Mm -hmm. Like I'm getting a beautiful product. You know, I hate to say this, but there are a lot of, um, I don't know, there are a lot of people in the fair trade space that I think rely so much on the story and on the impact that the actual product is like, yeah, that's okay, and I'll buy it because I really love sure. the story. Sure. And one of the things that we've said about Seiko from the beginning is that we want to be product-led, which yeah. means I want you to see the bag, see the caftan, see the necklace, see the sandals, whatever it is, and go, ooh. Yeah. In the most, like, base human yeah. part of who you are, go, ooh. Back. Yeah, I like this. <laughs> and then you get introduced to this story. And so what we see is that it's a win-win for everybody. They're walking away from a trunk show with products that they're like, I know that this is going to last me. I have a vision for where in my wardrobe. Yeah. This is, you know, the, the role that it's going to play. And every time I look at it, I'm going to be reminded that I was a part of the story mm -hmm. and helped yeah. contribute um, yeah. to sending a specific woman in Uganda mm -hmm. to college. And I love that because I think we all can resonate with doing good, and that's important. But I think that it's not a bad thing to recommend that looking good and helping women feel like they look good sure. is still worthwhile. Sure. We can do both. We yes. don't have to pick one or the other. And that is a big thing at Seiko that it's like, we. I do not believe in shopping is bad or, yeah. or you know, even necessarily like the complete capsule minimalistic. Like at the end of the day, the way our economy works if everybody decided that they were just going to stop purchasing products, there are billions of people that would be screwed. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's literally just how our economy works. We need people to buy things yeah. because people are going to make those things, and that's, that is how yeah. the world works. Yeah. So we're like, let's not, we don't even need to be down on shopping. Yeah. Actually, like, let's be up on shopping. Let's yeah. be up on style. Let's be up on products. But let's do that in a way that is life-giving and dignifying yeah. for everybody yeah. in the process. So thinking about that, I mean, you mentioned the economy, and I'm curious, sort of, we started this conversation with questions about the story of how you ended up in direct sales, but I'm curious from a very practical, business-minded approach, where is retail going? Is direct sales going to work? Like, what is your sense on where the market's going? Love this question. So I'm not claiming to be a prophet. I'm just claiming to read <laughs> facts to research. Y'all, brick and mortar retail is dying. Mm -hmm. Okay, over the next 10 years, over 25% of malls in America will close. That's a crazy number. There's a giant part of our economy that is shutting down um, for a couple of reasons. The main reason being uh, the transition to e-com, right? Where it's mm -hmm. like, you can't out Amazon, Amazon, and, right. uh, and Amazon is out Amazon and everybody. Say <laughs> um, so that, say so that so, um, and here's the thing, guess who else isn't going to out Amazon, Amazon? Seiko, right? We never will, and we're never going to try. But the amazing thing that's happening in the economy right now and in the market right now is there is a huge vacuum that is starting to open for the role that retail brick-and-mortar spaces play. Mm -hmm. What were those things? Um, getting to touch and feel a product in person. Like, e -com will continue to rise but there will always be people in specific products that it makes more sense to try on, to yeah. see in person, to yeah. touch and feel. So touching and feeling and interacting mm -hmm. with products. Customer service, mm -hmm. right? We've all had the experience of sitting on our computer and going back and forth about a size or a color, reading through the comments and the forums and trying to see if anybody else is, you know, your yeah. size and your height and how it fit them. And, you know, it's a rabbit trail. You waste, yeah. like, 45 minutes going I mean, to a random Yahoo forum. I mean, like three days trying to figure out something about curtains you bought. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So.
So, um, so just education about the product. Yeah. What happens when you can interact with a, an educated person that goes, here, I recommend this bag, and here's why. Here's the yeah. special feature that you might not have known about. Or let me yeah. tell you about this specific leather and how it's going to wear, and we'll kind of talk about whether or not that suits your lifestyle. Um, let me help you style your sandals. Tell me a little bit about your wardrobe, your lifestyle. That is like that will never go away, and the value that that plays um, to a consumer will never go away. The third thing is an experience, right? Like, don't get me wrong, I love online shopping, but there is something to be said for the experience of shopping, right? Yeah. Whether you're walking into an anthropology and it's beautifully decorated, you're having this, uh, you know, sights, sounds, smells, like experience. It's, you know, a Saturday afternoon, and you go with your mom and your sister, and what do you do? You walk down to the shopping area, and you win. You know, there's there's something to be said for how our products interact yeah. with us on an experiential level. Yeah. And with all three of those things, with customer service, with touching and feeling the product, and with experience, direct sales will fill that gap. Mm -hmm. There's a vacuum, and I truly, truly believe that that vacuum is going to be filled by direct sales because it's truly the way of the future of retail. I think it's interesting that we see it as kind of an old school model because it happened, you know, mainly in the 50s, specifically in rural areas where women had to drive three hours to go to a yeah. department store, and so they got this customer service in their home. Now what's happening now what happened basically is everybody was next to a store, so yeah. we didn't really need that anymore. Yeah. But what's going to happen over the next 10 and 20 years is that those stores are going away, and so it is truly kind of leaving, leaving this vacuum. And so um, not to mention that all of the statistics, all of the research is showing that sales is becoming and, and retail is becoming more social at a rapid rate, right? Mm -hmm. We're relying far less on what stores tell me I should like, you know, the big buyers and the gatekeepers and the people they're spending – millions of dollars advertising to me and, and sure. buying billboards and instead it's like I want to know Ellie where'd you get those pants yeah I, I think your style is great I care infinitely more about what you tell me than what some arbitrary editor at some you know magazine shares. and so direct sales really um, captures a lot of that of like mm -hmm. trust your friends trust the people in your community yeah. who have become experts in what they're great at and then yeah. you get to rely on them for all of those services um, yeah. that you might traditionally have given to someone in Nordstrom. Mm. I love that. I mean, it kind of wraps up, I think, some questions that I had and have been asking you, and then it makes it this really nice, complete package of there was a need, sort of a need for Seiko to take this journey into more impact for the women in the U.S., but then there's also just a really practical business need, and they happen to work together into this model. Absolutely. And it's... Absolutely. Really cool. Yeah. One of the last things that I do want to mention, um, because it didn't it didn't come up in our conversation, mm -hmm. is I want to talk really quickly about our Soul Sister mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. One of the things about Seiko um, that I really do think sets us apart, even maybe from some more mission-oriented organizations, um, when I started Seiko, one of the thoughts that I had was I think that there's something really transformational that happens in a human spirit when we meet someone and when we interact with someone who looks different than us, who comes from a yeah. different background, who has a different experience, yeah. and we realize that we actually share a lot more in common mm -hmm. than we think that we did, all of a sudden, that changes your entire worldview. Yeah. You know, that changes what you believe about the world. It changes how you read the news. It changes the decisions that you make in your day-to-day -day life. Um, so one of the things that we do at Seiko is when you become a fellow, you get to choose, or you can be assigned, um, one woman in Uganda, and that woman is your soul sister. Mm -hmm. She is your person. Uh, and every dollar of revenue that you generate here on the U.S. side of things is actually contributing directly to your soul sister earning a bonus scholarship. And what that does beyond the, like, finances of getting to help, you know, contribute to a bonus scholarship for a woman yeah. in Uganda the relational magic that happens in that, you know, there's so it's like we've got team Gift, we've got team Edith, we've got team um, Matilda. There's this beautiful sense of sisterhood and of rallying that happens of like, I'm on Matilda's team and I'm over here and I'm working my butt off for Matilda and I know that, it, that in a very, very direct one to one way, like I know that you're kind of thinking about buying that crossbody. Um, but you may just, you know, go buy something at Target or Nordstrom and say, I'm just telling you, if you buy that crossbody, you're a part of Matilda's story. Yeah. 
Um, and I know Matilda, and I love Matilda, and I'm working my way towards getting to meet Matilda in real life. And then when that actually happens, we won't even go there with our like fellows that have been to Uganda. Um, it's magic, and it's transformational, um, and 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 it helps to create this mutually beneficial team mentality that we have. The the last thing that I'll leave with before we go to questions is. Um, Seiko is not a charity. That's the thing. I don't want my mentors to, to work hard and be business women and not get paid well. I don't want my executives in Uganda to like show up yeah. and work hard and not be compensated. Right. No one is a recipient of charity yeah. at Seiko. Um, you are a member of a family. And one really quick anecdote, when we were in Uganda, um, I took the first uh, team of fellows over to Uganda in April of this year, and we were kind of explaining more about, you know, the fellows program and how it works and the Soul Sister Scholarship, mainly to our Ugandan team, and, and one of our team members, I can't remember who it was, it might have been, um, I don't know who I it was. I thought it was Sylvia. I think it was Sylvia, I think you're right. I think Sylvia raised her hand, and she goes, she goes, okay, okay, that's great, and, you know, we are, we're really grateful for our bonus scholarship and, you know, for the women who are earning, you know, money for us over here, but she raised her hand, she goes, but I want to know, like, what do the fellows get out of this? And there was this sense of like protectiveness and like, you know, she's working her butt off to like sell those products. Like that's hard work. And yeah, we're working really hard to make the products, but I want to know there wasn't a complete understanding that fellows earn money off of all of yeah. the products. Right. And so when we were like, Oh, even though she doesn't get a bonus scholarship and every time she sells a pair of sandals, money goes into her pocket and literally our team like erupted in cheers. They're like, yeah, you guys are bosses. We're bosses. Like there's zero sense of like, oh, we're, we, we're needy and we're vulnerable and please like help us. And instead yeah. like, I'm really good That's at making amazing. stuff. You're really good at selling stuff. If we yeah. like work together and create a partnership, yeah. world domination. Which is really okay, y'all, we um, are so grateful that you have joined us. We're at the hour mark. So those of you who are on long lunch breaks or who have uh, kids that are getting squirrely, we really appreciate your time. We are going to move into asking questions. Um, and I have carved out time and space. Uh, I don't know what you're, yeah. if, if you can um, stick around, but we, this is the time, uh, this is our tell all. So you can, if anything that we said you want more clarification on or comments, um, we would love, we would love to hear them. Awesome. Yes, we have lots and lots of love for our soul sisters. Hashtag Team Frosty and Team Matilda and Shakira and everybody's so under. Um, Haley Potter asked, um, someone with a young, young baby um, who can't really be entertained by other things, can you give a tip or two on how to do this well? Um, and speaking from experience for Haley, she's had a newborn new that is so born. cute. Wow. And no, she doesn't nap. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> Haley, I don't know how you do it. Na Theo was a great napper, and that was like, I probably started working when I was on maternity leave, I don't know, a couple weeks in, but it was always during Theo's naps, and it was a, it was so good for my mentalness. So I have no advice for what to do with a baby that doesn't nap other than to say we are with you, we are for you, I will pray for you and that that baby naps. Um, but I do think that my main piece of advice is going to go back to, um, one, you know what it means for you in this season of life to push yourself a little bit beyond comfort, to be brave, to be bold, but also to allow yourself seasons and to know in this specific season what does it mean to be successful and here's the thing you have to know that you have to know that you have to write it down you have to declare it because here's what's not being successful kind of thinking in your head you want to do something and then trying and you're like not really doing it so so and it's too hard so you kind of change it in your head you never really said it out loud so you kind of change it and say like well I never really thought I was going to do that anywhere that was unrealistic or whatever it is and then that kind of cycle keeps happening um, you never want your goals should never be based off of your current reality, right? Because it's like goals are all about the future yeah. and it's all about yeah. growth and it's all about moving forward. Now that being said, you've got to take into consideration where you are today as you create those goals, what you want for your life. Um, and I'm a really big fan of knowing what does it look like next month? What does it look like six months from now? And what does it look like three years from now? Um, and allowing yourself like, you know how many times I've, you know, said, like, this is where space is going to be. It's like, we literally just changed our entire, I met three years ago, did not have this on the map, and our entire model has changed. But three years ago, did I have an idea of where I thought we would be three years from now? Like, 
Yes. We're never going to be 100% right. The point is not to be right and to be future predictors. The point is to know that if you don't know it, if you don't write it down, if you're not faithful to it, it won't ever happen. Um, so that would be my encouragement to you during this season is maybe spend some time and some space thinking about um, thinking about the goals and thinking about just what does it look like for you, Haley Potter, mom of two delicious kids, um, you know, to to run this race well. Um, and then to seek the resources and community and support from your sisters. Yes. Another great question from Molly. Walter, Molly says, Hi, Molly. Uh, can you put the bad badges program in your own words? So can you like just kind of briefly describe how you would explain the, the badges program to a new customer or say you're at a trunk show? How would you kind of briefly describe what the badges program is? Yeah, so first of all, I would tell them that uh, the base level commitment that Seiko has to our employees in Uganda um, is that we're paying everyone a fair wage. They're getting access to comprehensive health care, um, our social impact program, that our bonus scholarship is really our over the top. Like if Seiko succeeds here in the U.S., if we sell a lot, everybody succeeds and making sure that that trickles down all the way to our team in Uganda. So that's why we call it a bonus scholarship. I never want someone to think, well, if you don't, buy that sandal, that girl's not going to Right, no, that's terrible. We've figured that out, and we've taken that upon ourselves to make that happen. Um, so this is kind of the over and above. And basically how it works is it's all or nothing. We have set the goal of for us to be over the top, kind of generous, and to get to, to add on this additional bonus. Here's how we have to perform in the States. And we've essentially broken that down um, into badges because it's a lot easier to track. Um, in that way. And so every time you have a qualifying sale over $100, you earn one. It's, it's really easy. It's one badge for $100. That badge goes directly towards your soul sister. And once she earns a set amount of badges that doesn't change, we've done the calculations and figured out what that is, and you have secured a bonus scholarship for her. Now, the cool thing is that it is all or nothing. We can't be, like, it's not fair for me to punish Matilda because her yeah. team didn't sell, and so she gets the scholarship, but someone else doesn't. And so what we've had to do is we've had to say, it's we're all sink or swim together. Yeah. Um, either everybody wins or nobody wins. And by wins, again, I mean it's it's this bonus. It's this yeah. extra oomph to go. Yeah. Go to university, pursue your dreams. For our women who aren't university bound, um, we sit down with them at the beginning of every um, year and we basically ask them, like, what are you dreaming about? What are your financial goals? What would you do if you had a little bit of extra cash, yeah. you know, to infuse? And the dreams and the things that they are coming up with are so amazing and inspiring and it's, it's really fun to see. So um, basically it's a way for us to um, – for, our, for, for us to give our customers a really clear understanding that every dollar that they spend with you is directly contributing um, to this bonus scholarship for our team in Uganda. And you know what? I bet that there are other fellows that are more practiced in doing that more in a trunk show environment that would probably have a more uh, trunk show oriented and sales way yeah. of saying that that might be even better than me. So you should ask them. And I have a challenge. If you think that you can do it better than I just did, which I bet that there are some of you out there, I want you to post your explain the soul sister badges in under 30 seconds. Mine was probably not under 30 <laughs> seconds. And I am going to judge all of the videos that you submit, and I'm going to give a prize. How did they submit them? They will submit them on Facebook. All right, there you go. Challenge. Challenge. Hopefully it's accepted. accepted. I see cards. 30 oh, seconds. 30 seconds soul sister scholarship. I'm excited. Okay. What other right. questions do we have? Make sure you tag Seiko in that. And we have a question from Dawn Gordon. She has, says, as a Canadian, how can I help your mission? Oh, Dawn. We love First Canadians. of all, you're amazing. We love our Canadians. Uh, My best friends just got home from Quebec. Um, can I say that right? I don't know. <laughs> I tried to sound French. Um, ways that our international sisters can support us. Um, well, one, the amazing thing about the internet is that it's international. Um, so sharing, although we don't have fellows in Canada, um, if you know people in the U.S. who would want to be fellows who would make great hostesses, that is a huge way that our customers and our fans can advocate for us is um, by getting people who might be interested in hosting a show to just be aware of Seiko, to know that it exists. Um, they can email us or they can find a fellow near them. We can hook them up with a fellow if they would like to host a show. 
or to tell women in the U.S. about the opportunity. But honestly, even just telling your Canadian friends um, and having your friends just buy directly online through us um, is a massive way that you can support us. And I'm 99.9% .9 confident that Canada is on the radar. So if and when, and probably number one, if and when we expand globally, it's really likely that Canada will be our first stop. And so if we have a country of people who already know what Seiko is, who are wearing the product, who have heard about it from a friend of a friend, or they saw a Facebook post or read a blog about it, that is um, that can be a massive help to us. So thank you for asking. Monique asks, um, how far are we along in our badges so far oh, this year? That might Which be a free, I, that might be a free <laughs> Happy to chime question. in on. And oh, one thing I wanted to say for Dawn, um, don't hesitate, even if you are overseas and don't live in the U.S., please still apply because we are saving all of our international applications. Oh, yes. Yes. And so right. by the time that we are ready to move into Canada, Dawn, for us to have your information um, in our database will be super helpful. So don't hesitate yeah. to apply now. And Dawn, even sharing this video um, with your community, uh, you never know who in your community might click on it and go, yeah. uh. Maybe this was just the thing I've been looking for, or just the thing that I didn't know that I was looking mm -hmm. for that mm -hmm. feels like it could be a great thing. Yeah. Yeah. And for everyone, if everyone who was on this, actually, I'm just going to be really bold. Yeah. I'm going to be really bold. If every single person that tuned into this call just shared this video with yeah. their community, whether you're a fellow, whether you've been a hostess, whether you're just now here about Seiko, um, and shared it with their community and, and yeah. um, why they should watch this and why it might be interesting, yeah, that would have a really big impact. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. just I an idea. Uh, so to go back to Monique's question really quick about how we are doing in our 2017 badges um, and our Soul Sister Scholarship so far. So at the end of August, we were about 55% of the way through our goal um, of 325 badges for all 33 Soul Sisters. So, we so which is over double what we did. So last year we only did scholarships for our university bound women. This year we offer the program to our entire team. I love, I love the veteran. I do too, but it's a big goal. It's a big goal. So uh, it's good. We're we're like on pace. Basically, to summarize it, on pace, but gonna have to hustle. Hustle. <laughs> Q4, we're going to need a lot of hustle yeah. to make it happen. And again, this is not like if we, it's not made up. If we don't do this in sales, we don't as a company have the money. We yes. do not have the cash to be able to provide yes. this. So it really is, it's not a marketing gimmick. Yes. It's like a real, like if we, perf it's like how bonuses in the real world yeah. work. If our company performs, you get a bonus. If we don't, you yeah. don't. Um, so please, <laughs> please get all your badges. <laughs> Um, any other questions before we yeah, hop off? I think we are wrapping up. We're Somebody wrapping says, up. woo, over halfway there, living on a prayer, and some hustle. <laughs> that that <laughs> would be a great motto for Psycho Fellows. Living on a prayer, and a little hustle. <laughs> I, I love, love it. it. Well, you guys right. have been awesome. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us a chunk of your valuable time and energy yeah. to be with us today. Um, again, know that we love hard questions and yeah. we value um, transparency. And if there's anything we can ever do to help illuminate or give insight, I'm honestly, this video, the reason that I did this video is because probably 15, 20 of you guys, our fellows, were like, hey, I really like, you know, there had been some stuff coming out about other MLMs and it had some people really shaken up yeah. and they didn't feel like they totally knew how to respond. And, and they were like, hey, we would love it if, if you could go live, essentially, and give us a yeah. little bit more of an understanding of, you know, how we can respond to this or, you know. And so that's why we did this. Yeah. It was 100%. Like, y'all, we do not exaggerate that, like, we – fellows are a part of our company. Yeah. They help grow and guide in uh, where we're spending our time and our resources. So that's why we hopped on yeah. live today. Um, so just know that this is, this is our testament to that we love you, we hear yeah. you. Whether or not you're a fellow or you're going to be a fellow, there's only really two two possibilities, <laughs> right? Um, we welcome your yeah. questions and we feedback. Do. And we want to keep the conversation going. Yes. So as these questions come up, I think we never want to shy away from them. And we really count on you to let us know what questions you're hearing. And, and all the things we talked about today, we wouldn't necessarily know. Sure. Sitting here at yeah. HQ, if yeah. you were telling us, like, these are real issues that I'm feeling insecure about or my customers are. So... We appreciate that, and anytime you have a scary question, please invite us into the scary question with you. And we want to be yes, yes. And I will leave you off with: if you are a psycho fellow, 
and someone asks you if you're in an MLM, I know what this is. you know what to tell them, ladies. You say, oh, yes. It's my, my life. life's mission! <laughs> All right, we love you guys. Thanks for joining, and we'll see you soon.